Realtors on the road today. I'm actually in Newport, Rhode Island, and I'm going to be visiting a builder friend who's got a house under construction. We're going to give you a full tour, look at the framing, and see how they build here. But look at this house right here. This is pretty iconic for this area. We've got grayed out cedar shingle siding, a grayed out cedar shingle roof. We've got all copper details. But I, my understanding is the house we're going to go visit, where my friend Wade is building, has some real similar details to that. Real iconic coastal. And Wade tells me that the roof is not on this house yet, so we should be able to really see behind the scenes on the framing, insulation details, what his foundation looks like, how he's waterproofed, all those things. It's gonna be a really fun video. Here's the house right here. Oh man, look at those Gambrel roof details. Oh, I like this. This is gonna be fun. Let's go find Wade. Look who's back in the build show again, my buddy Wade Paquin. Hey, Wade. Welcome back to Rhode Island, Matt. Man, it's so good to see you again. Good to see you it's too. so pretty around here. Let's go take a tour of this one and show these guys. What do you think? Let's do it. Come on. This is a pretty house, Wade. What are we looking at here, buddy? Yeah, welcome back, first of all. It's good to have you back in Newport. I love this place. Yeah, um, we're building a beautiful home here for some clients that live adjacent to the property. Okay. Uh, we're collaborating with the local architect, Chris Arner, on this project. Uh huh. Kind of classic New England shingle style home oh, right here in look. the historic dist district in Newport. So similar to that house next door as I'm driving up, it's gonna be an all shingle exterior, shingle roof, white iconic trim. There's probably cedar trim outside. Yeah, uh, Alaskan yellow roof and sidewall shingles oh. and all cedar trim that will get painted. Gorgeous, man. Yeah, beautiful. Not a huge house. What is this? Maybe three, 3,500 square feet? You're just shy of 3,000 square feet here. Okay. Older couple, retired, looking for their you know, dream home to enjoy here in beautiful Newport. Oh man, very cool. All right, so let's talk about the construction. We're on the first floor now. We've got a basement underneath us. And the first thing I'm noticing is that you're framing here in Rhode Island. It's very different, although some similarities to how we do it in Texas. So first, let's talk framing lumber. What is all this beautiful white framing lumber I'm seeing? Yep, so uh, you're looking at two by six uh, SPF KD. So that's spruce, pine, or fir is the call out on that. Uh, and it's kiln dried. Okay, so 15% moisture content or less, so it's already fairly stable, it's dry, it's not gonna move on us. Correct. You're framing 16 inch on centers, it looks like on your outside walls. Correct. And then what's our sheathing on the outside here? So we are using the uh, Zip R3 sheathing here, ah. um, and we're doing that just to provide uh, a bit of a thermal break. Got it, so Zip R sheathing, that's their 7 16th green uh, face that already has their waterproofing layer on it. And then in between the sheathing and your stud is a half inch of some type of poly iso uh, insulation. So R3 on the entire outside as a blanket mm -hmm. before you come in. And then right away, I'm seeing a detail that we do not do anywhere in the south. What is the strapping that I'm seeing on the ceiling? Yeah, so that's a one by three. Okay. Uh, same thing, SPF lumber. So that's what this is right here, that's one by exactly three. exactly it. So yeah. it's actually three quarters by two and a half. And your framers are putting that up before mechanicals, it looks like, huh? Yeah, uh, it helps with a couple things. The electrician doesn't need to drill for his wires, so he can mm -hmm. just staple them up to the bottom of the joist and run his, his wires. Um, it also provides some stability on the joist from twisting. Mm -hmm. um, and if any of the wood um, has any imperfections, maybe one joist is, a, say, an eighth inch, um, you know, smaller down, or yeah. bigger than its adjacent joist, you can bring that uh, strip the fairing strip down now did you now did you do that now or are you going to do that later in the process we'll do that later we'll let the, go, get the house um, framed up weather tight and um, you know things going to move around a little bit during that process yeah. and then before we start any sort of um, you know rough in phase we'll go and take a look at that and run strings and lasers and bring that down so we have a nice flat ceiling okay so you could shim that later to get that ceiling nice and flat and i can tell you one huge advantage i'm seeing already right here is all those joist hangers on those two by eight or two by 10 floor joists, boom, once you put that strapping on, you don't have to worry about that hump and the drywall around exactly, that spot. Yeah. That's really cool. Tell me, I'm seeing traditional lumber. Is that normal for, for this area for floor joists, two by eight, two by 10? No, we typically use eye joists. Mm -hmm. um, here, we, our largest span's 14 feet. Oh, so not that long. Uh, so we don't have any big spans. And uh, you know we were working with a budget 
here to get this project done for the client, so this helps save a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. With the traditional lumber. And you probably don't have any mechanicals like I do. Uh, you know, I'm slab on grade, so all my ductwork's got to run through my floor joist area. I need those open webs. And here, probably your furnace is in the basement blowing up through some walls and then coming over, right? Yes, we'll uh, floor feed this floor and mm -hmm. we'll ceiling feed the second floor. Okay, so you'll actually have floor registers in this floor. There will be no ductwork in the walls at all. Correct. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, what's on top here? It looks like you've got some Advantech sheathing, maybe? Is that, yep. what size is that? That's uh, three quarter Advantech. Okay. And uh, that's applied with the Advantech mm -hmm. adhesive. So that's what that purple squeeze out is that I'm seeing. That's this right here, right? Correct. Now, what do you like about this? Uh, I like that it's easy to install, and if your joists are wet, mm -hmm. you can still install the product. Uh -huh. Where, you know, in the old days when we used to use PL, PL Premium or yeah. subfloor adhesive, uh, you couldn't apply it to anything. Yeah, it, any it would fall off too because of the water. Bond, right. Yeah, interesting. And the other thing about this that I like, Wade, and I use this down in Texas too, is the coverage. You know, one of these one of these cans that comes out with a foam gun is like the equivalent of eight or so tubes, so your framer gets a lot of coverage out of this. Yeah, I think we've only used six cans on the whole house so is far. Is that right, for both it decks? Probably would have been a case and a half of glue. Yeah, that's not bad at all, very mm -hmm. little waste. Very cool. Um, what else am I missing on this floor that we haven't talked about framing-wise? I'm seeing you've got California corners, it looks like, on your outsides. Your framers do that on all your projects? All the projects, yeah. Yeah, so then you get that insulation stuffed all the way back in the corners. And a mix of header types. This header over here that's a bigger span looks like LVL headers, but everything else is all traditional headers. It looks like two by material with maybe plywood in between. Is that Correct. what I'm saying? Yeah, you'll see on um, the LVLs, those are usually three LVLs will make up the wall thickness. And then on uh, the traditional, you'll see a half inch of plywood between each piece of two by 10. To get to the correct five and a half inch width. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. What, um, what am I seeing with these LVL posts in here? And it looks like just a couple of uh, LVL beams. Are those bringing point loads from upstairs? Yeah, so we got our Versa lamps here. These are just point loads coming down uh, from the uh, roof system. I'll tell you what, before we go upstairs, Wade, let's look at the plans and orient these guys to kind of what we're looking at. Sure. I think the architecture is beautiful. I want to show these guys kind of what the house looks like. Okay, Wade, tell us about this uh, front ele elevation we've got here. Yeah, so this is the elevation you came in. This is the front uh, entry door here, single car garage. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is this component here. We haven't framed this up yet, but this is going to be a beautiful uh, screened in porch, cathedral ceiling, probably all cedar, or mahogany, something mm, beautiful. Really beautiful. And then all of this front facade and the roof is all cedar shingles, right? That will gray out? Correct. Yep. Oh, all man. the uh, sidewall oh. and roof will be Alaskan yellow cedar. All the flashing around all the uh, roof oh, rakes. Copper and eaves, as well as all of our valleys, um, will be red copper. Oh man, that's gorgeous. And then all this white trim that will get painted, that's all cedar, is that what you said? Yes, that will all be uh, you know, clear vertical grain, solid cedar that will get primed and painted. And that's really pretty. Now look at, I love seeing this. Chris uh, Arner, and I'm pronouncing that right, the architect, look at this great detail in the plans for you, Wade. You've got your cedar shingles here, you've got a cedar breather, which is a, a 3D mesh that's gonna let those shingles dry out. Uh, both to the front and the back. He's showing how to do the step flashing, which is going to be all copper as well with soldered seams here. And then he's showing how the walls uh, shingles come down and interact here with the roof shingles. Man, that's, I love seeing details like that. Good job, they Mr. Help, Architect. They help us do our job well. Now let's look at a section cut on the house. So I mentioned earlier the house has a foundation. So you've got a full in ground foundation here. It looks like maybe eight foot walls based on this plan. And then we're right here on this first floor and we still have an upstairs floor that with this, is it Gambrel or Gambrel style roof? Gambrel. Gambrel, okay, so we've got full bedroom space upstairs and then a little bit of mechanicals above that as well. I also like that your insulation envelope is coming all the way up to the roof line and all the way back down. So all these mechanicals up here will be in a conditioned space as well. Now tell me about your foundation. How are you guys doing that in Rhode Island? So we apply a, um, a hot liquid uh, spray to the foundation. Ah, can we see that on the outside anywhere? I think we can in a couple spots. Cool, we'll look at that in a minute. And then you've got it, so you've got a traditional footing that's happening right here, and that's get, that gets poured before anything gets poured. And then you probably have a wall that comes in and gets poured on top of that. And then you've got some outside insulation, drainage, and waterproofing here. 
And then these two circles is your French drain system, and there's probably a sump pit that is connected to in the basement, is that right? That's correct. So, like I said, we'll apply that liquid hot spray on the foundation, and then we apply a two-inch drainage board to that. That allows the water to go down along the foundation and pick up that pipe system. Cool. I like that. These are some good plants. I like seeing all the details for your cedar on the outside, too. And then if you flip to the back here, Wade's got his engineering. This is all the S. Uh, all the plans that are labeled S will mean structural. And so these are all the details for the rebar and how it connects, for the thickness of the walls. That's all the details we need as a builder uh, to make sure this house gets built well and the engineer is, and we're building it the way the engineer has designed it. Um, before we leave this area real quick, while we've got these stud bays open, Talk to me about your insulation strategy for all the above buried walls. What are you doing for these walls and then up in the uh, ceiling upstairs in that condition space? So Matt, these bays, um, we're going to be using a mineral wall okay, and then an uh, interior uh, vapor barrier. Ah, very nice. So this will get a five and a half inch deep uh, blown in or a bat for here? Bat. A bat, okay. And then the vapor barrier on the inside, what are you going to use for the vapor barrier in this house? We're going to be using the uh, Sega My Vest here. Oh, very cool. The Swiss stuff that the we Swiss saw stuff. over in Switzerland. Yes. Awesome. And then how about for the roof insulation? What are you doing up there? Uh, two inches of closed cell mm -hmm. on the roof deck, and then we'll uh, fill in the rafter bays with uh, more mineral wool bats up there. Okay. So you've got a nice condition envelope here. Let's go upstairs, Wade, and show everybody what's happening on the roof. Let's do it. Oh, man, this is some pretty framing, Wade. Gambrel, Gambrel, how do you pronounce it again? Uh, these are Gambrels. Oh, man, this is gorgeous. And check out that view, guys. Look at that. Is that the ocean we're seeing right there? Or is yeah. that a bay? That's the Atlantic Ocean. Uh -huh. uh, you're looking at this cove here. It's um, First Beach or Easton's Beach. Okay. And out in the distance there, that's Sakonet Point. And if you look out to the right, you can actually see the Sakonet Lighthouse. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Man, and check this out too, Wade, while we're up here. This house next door with those grayed out shingles, I'm assuming that's going to be a similar look to this house, right? That's the exact shingle we're using right white there. White trim around the windows, white rake trim, maybe a white crown molding and then uh, that cedar that grays out. And do you have a flare detail too on this house? I forgot to look at that on the plans. We do, yeah, and okay. we have a mock-up of that we can take a look at too. Okay, cool. Now talk to me about these um, Gambrel gables that we're seeing here. You're framing these in the deck and then standing them up, is that right? Yes, we, uh, we'll frame the wall assembly right here in the deck. You can actually see some of the pencil marks on the decking oh, where yeah. it's all laid out. Okay. Um, so the, the framing team will frame this. And sheathe it on the ground as well. And sheathe it and even trim out uh, the, the rake trim right uh, on the deck too. While it's on the ground. Now mm -hmm. that's smart. So you're not working off the ladder for anything. Working off the ladder. We'll do the liquid flashing on the nail holes. Oh, is that right? We'll, we'll prime, spot prime, and um, take care of all the cedar when it goes up right there. Smart, man. I love it. Now, your decking, is this nailed or screwed in for your, uh, we talked about the Advantech glue already, but how are you actually fastening? Uh, we use the PamFast um, screw drive system here. Oh, the collated screw. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's like a driver that you can do this action and drop yeah. a screw in. You, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's almost as fast as a nail gun. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. And now, and now the, the Advantech is marked, it looks like, too, for locations for 16-inch on center. Is that true? That's correct. Oh, man, that's nice. Yeah, so all I got to do is drop one in each one of those holes. Proof. Yeah, there's no, there's no mistakes to mm -hmm. be made. Now tell me about the metal wall bracing you're using. I don't see that in Texas very often. Are those your braces or the framers? Yeah, most of these are the framers. We have some, um, but you can see they're a little less bulky than having mm -hmm. a bunch of uh, two by four braces around. Yeah. And it's just fast. You know, we'll lock them in with, with a nice structural screw. Oh man, yeah. And, um, and then you're tight for the weekend. These walls aren't going anywhere. For the weekend, a couple screw. turns of these, you, get the, you can adjust the wall in or out, so you get it nice and plumb. Okay, yeah, so you've got a turnbuckle here, and when you turn this, you're gonna get that micro adjustment to get that wall perfectly plumbed. Exactly. And then put a screw in it and you're done. Well, actually, no, the screw's in it already. You're just turning you're just it to turning. get it to the right spot. Right. So they can, the framer can adjust that. And they're nice and strong, too. Also see he's using those structural screws on all of your safety rails around the edges. The framer's done a good job on that. Mm -hmm. Well done, Wade. Thank you. Now tell me about the Zip R sheathing. Are you using that often? What do you think about it? Are you seeing any compression? Talk to me about shear value. Some of those kinds of things. Full disclosure, first time. 
okay. with the R uh, R sheathing. First time using Zip too? No, we've been using Zip for years. That's what I thought. Yeah, okay. but the first time using the uh, R sheathing. Okay. Uh, this is just the R3, mm -hmm. um, and we've had no issues with it. I was looking for a little bit of compression mm -hmm. around our openings, um, but I haven't seen anything yet. I was looking, you know, kind of around the perimeter of these window Yeah, because the, the foam is in between the sheathing that's on the outside and the framing here to, Correct. to to break that thermal, but you still have the continuous sheathing on the outside. So now when your shingle guy's nailing your shingles up, he's got sheathing everywhere, right? Correct. That's pretty nice. And and no compression here at the window openings when you're nailing that off, huh? No, we haven't noticed any compression. Because you um, need a perfectly flat wall for shingles, I would assume. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Well done. All right, here's something I don't see every day. <laughs> You've got a cut station over here and your framer has Gorilla Glue at the cut station. What is he using this polyurethane glue for over here? So that's getting on, uh, going on the joints of all the uh, cedar trim on the Gambrel uh, rakes. Ah, gotcha. So again, a heck of a lot easier to install when it's Do that on flat the ground. on the ground. And then you mentioned earlier, he's doing the liquid flash on the nail heads and he's doing that on the ground too. So rather than working off a ladder and trying to uh, do that on the ladder right here on the ground, super easy. We want to do as much as we can when the wall assembly is on the deck before we stand it up. Yeah, here's another sign of a good builder and a good framer. You know what that is, y'all? That is a can of primer. <laughs> Tell us about this, Wade. We're using this. So uh, end cuts and you know some of the joints, if we're doing a little bit of sanding, mm -hmm. um, then they can spot prime that. So you're using cedar trim on the outside. That's required in this area. So we've got, let's say, a, a, a raw cedar crown molding. You're going to prime that first. The cut man is going to cut it, and then he's going to prime it, and then he's going to glue it and nail it on the wall. So that cedar's primed on all sides. That is Correct. That's awesome, dude. Well done. Thank you. Impressive job, my friend. Um, let's go outside, Wade, because you've got a couple details for foundation waterproofing that are showing and for a couple of zip techniques for air sealing that I really want to show these guys. So let's meet these guys in the front of the house. All right, so we're in the back of the house uh, now, Wade. Tell us about uh, Zip. You've used this a bunch. Give us a couple tips for install for a builder who's not used this before. Sure, a couple simple tips. Um, first and foremost, don't overdrive your fasteners. Mm -hmm. um, look at it like screwing sheetrock. When so you, you're not breaking the paper face, in other words. Right, you want to just break the surface, mm -hmm. but not oversink the screw. Same yeah. concept applies here. You don't want to sink that nail an eighth inch past the uh, surface of the sheathing. Yeah, got it. Um, and then that we like the proofing. belt and suspenders approach, so we'll apply the liquid flashing over each nail hole so mm -hmm. we don't have any potential for leaks. And here's a little tip for you on that, guys. Uh, I found this on the job. This is Wade's scraper that happens to be labeled zip sheathing, but this is basically a Bondo scraper. You can get this at any hardware store or home center. And once it's dried, you can see that liquid flash comes right off. There's some silicone, uh, silicone, I pronounce it, in these scrapers. So once it sets overnight, it'll scrape right off. You're ready to go for the next day. And these make it really easy to just wipe that down. Mm -hmm. And I also saw that Wade prefers these versions, which are every frame in the world has a glue cartridge that fits these uh, 20 ounce, yeah, 29 29. ounce rather, uh, tubes. So all he's gotta do is cut the tip right here uh, and then cut this tip and then he's ready to go mm -hmm. with liquid flash for all these areas. Number two, about the tape. The tape. Um, so you'll see a lot of guys roll the tape out and just apply it with their hand. Mm -hmm. That's a big no-no. Yeah. Uh, the tape is pressure sensitive. There are chemicals in the tape are activated by the pressure of the roller. Um, so that's gonna allow the tape to really bond you know, the zip system has a little bit of texture to it. Mm -hmm. So that tape really kind of grips and uses that texture as an anchor. Got it. Um, now what's this what's, fancy roller you yeah, got Yeah, what's here? great with this roller is um, it's got a little Z's here in the middle. <laughs> like a typewriter Z. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't know if you can pan in here, Joey, but you can see the Z's on the tape. And that tells us that the tape has been properly rolled. Yeah, and you got a little sawdust which is lodged on that Z so you can see it even better. Where there's no sawdust, it's a little harder to see, but the impression is made on the tape. And now you know that pressure-sensitive adhesive has gotten wetted to the surface. And now look, it's, it is not coming off. That is bonded on there mm -hmm. real well. And my understanding is that bond's only going to increase over time. Mm -hmm. Now what's up with the painter's tape over here on the foundation? What do you got going on here? Uh, that's just my obsession with attention to detail. Yeah, love that. Um, 
this doesn't need to be taped. I just wanted a nice clean line here. But what are you doing here? What's this process? So I ripped a piece of one by one pressure treated lumber right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we screwed that into the sill plate. Okay. And that's going to allow me to take my liquid flashing and run that from the sheathing over the pressure treated and around back to the foundation. Ah. Um, so we're doing that for a few reasons. Air, mm -hmm. water, sp yep. splash up, and bugs. And you're also sealing off that open, because this is now one inch thick sheeting because you've got half inch foam, he's, he's not allowing bugs to get into that foam on the underside where it would have normally been exposed otherwise, right? Correct. Yep. Now what are you using the backer rod for? I saw this on the job. Yeah, um, so in a couple of spots, you know, the foundation's never perfect. Mm -hmm. um, typically this, this plywood is pretty tight to the um, face of the concrete. Yep. In some areas there might be a little bit of a gap so I like to put, put the backer rod, jam it up in the gap, so when I apply the liquid flashing up against the foundation, it gives me a surface uh, so it doesn't you know, fill and have like cavities and voids yeah, in the void flashing. In and this is just some inexpensive 3 8 backer rod. Pick you that up here, local just hardware about store. Anywhere and it'll shove into a small gap or it'll fill up to a 3 8 of a gap. That's really smart, I like that. So now we're fully protected from bugs, we're nice and air sealed. We're ready for shingles at this point. Yeah. yeah Very nice, cool. Nice clean line. Now, I think I saw when we walked over here, Wade, there's a spot on your foundation we can kind of get a, a clue for what your foundation waterproofing is because we're in climate zone four here. So you've got a, what, a three foot frost line, something like that in this house? Uh, we are almost a 48 inch or 42. 42 inch, inch frost here. line. Yep. Okay, so we're way down there for those footings. Mm -hmm. What is this? It looks like carpet pad. Yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a giant's carpet pad. Recycled material. Uh huh. Um, so you can see behind it the um, hot liquid spray that goes on the foundation okay, so first. That's black spray that's on there. That's a waterproofing. That's your waterproofing. That runs down the concrete uh, foundation wall and across mm -hmm. the top of the footing. Okay. And then we apply this uh, two inch drainage board, huh. which allows the water to run along the foundation to pick up their perimeter drain. Uh -huh. And this also provides an R, I believe 12.6. Really? So drainage and insulation all in one, and it's a recycle product. Who makes all this stuff? Uh, this is a product called Tough and Dry. Tough and Dry, never heard of it. Is that pretty uh, used locally here a lot? Yeah, we use it on most of our foundations and it's often in the specifications on most of the projects. And are you, is your guys doing this or do you have a sub who's doing this for you? Our uh, insulation sub does that for us. So he does this as well as all the foam work for us. Huh, your insulation guy, that's wild. Well, let's walk in the basement. Speaking of insulation, I don't get to see a lot of these in uh, Texas where I am. Now, what is this base coat of insulation I'm seeing here at the bottom of your walls? Um, two inch closed cell spray foam. Uh -huh on the wall yeah. and right underneath the slab. Oh, so uh, you spray that right on the dirt or your compacted gravel or whatever's down here? We use crushed stone. Okay. Um, you can basically spray close cell on anything, mm -hmm. but the best bond will be to the crushed stone. And if you think of it like the voids in the crushed stone mm -hmm. allows that foam to kind of anchor itself in the foam and it creates a nice grip wow. so it doesn't lift up. Where if you sprayed this on compacted gravel, it can start to float around a bit. Cool, man. I saw a picture of this on Instagram then. So your spray foam guy came in, put that all the way down on the floor, was able to walk on it, it's rigid, mm -hmm. and sprayed it up the wall. And then you came in later and poured this basement slab. Correct. That's and I do that for a few reasons. I know I'm not a big fan of rigid foam insulation on the slabs with mm -hmm. the tape. I like the, um, you know, the monolithic mm -hmm. approach to the spray foam. Yep. Um, and you also have an excellent R value off, off this is R14, just in two inches. Now, now you've sprayed up the wall and kind of tapered it. What's happening with that? Yeah, so we feather it out. And then once the house is weather tight, we'll bring that right up to the bottom of our subfloor system and fill in all the rim boards. Oh, I like that. That's sweet. So basically you're going to kind of kind of almost shiplap this joint right here, or scarf joint that insulation. So it comes all the way up and then you're going to spray it all the way to the bottom side of your Advantech decking right here. Mm -hmm. So you've got a nice air seal and it's going to be nice and uh, insulated through that whole band joist down there. And that with traditional insulation is super hard to insulate and incredibly hard to air seal. Mm -hmm. But with that closed cell foam, that's going to work really well. I like that. Now this is a detail you don't see. This is, this is something that uh, my guess is the framer or Wade makes on their jobs often. A lumber rack, 
so that his cedar, is that right? Yep, that's cedar. Is protected and is not just sitting on the concrete to soak up the moisture. Mm -hmm. Well done, Wade. Now this, this is all pre-prime cedar, huh? Do you get it primed from your dealer locally? Yeah, we can get uh, typical stock, you know, one by four through one by 12, primed, pre-primed. clear vertical grain. Oh, um, nice but word. like the crown molding, that's a, a custom profile. So we had to have a knife made. We milled all that. It's raw. Right. We prime it on site. Got it. You don't have any idea what the cedar costs in your market, day? Off the top of my head, I yeah, don't know. I'm curious. So now I bet people, I'll, I'll post a comment from Wade on the I'll uh, let video you know. once it's up. All right, Wade, one more thing that I want to, or two more things I want to point out down here. Um, back in the day when I was building DC, I used to call it these lolly columns. I'm not sure what you're calling these, but tell me your, your process for installing these basement steel beams. Yeah, so this is a uh, HSS, it's basically tube steel. Mm -hmm. So it's quarter inch wall, okay. hollow. Um, this is on a, about a 24 inch by 24 inch by one foot um, thick footing. Okay. Um, so that's in place when your footers are put in. Correct. And then your framer, when he's framing, I'm assuming you poured this basement slab after this framing. After, so we put some temporary supports up. Mm -hmm. And then um, these come in and we get them anchored into the footing with some epoxy. They, they're kept about a half inch off the footing, non-shrink grout underneath. Mm -hmm and then we get this locked in and then we can pour our slab. And then you've got a couple timber lock screws that are locking them into that beam above and you've mm -hmm. got a stout structure that's not going anywhere. Not gonna move. That's really nice. Now what's, what's the big uh, pit that I'm seeing over here? This is our elevator uh, shaft right here going uh -huh. up. Uh, so this is for the elevator to come uh, down to come here on the bottom stop. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, anything special about your sump pit that you wanna tell us about? Standard sump pit, uh, so there's perimeter drainage around the basement here. Yeah, we tried to show that on the plans. Yep, four inch, um, schedule 35, mm -hmm. and that dumps right in here, and we'll put a sump pump in, we'll bring that out, and uh, exit the water to the outside. Do you need any backup pumps or batteries or anything like that? Are you a big fan of those? What do you, do you do anything special for that? Um, the ho this house will be on a generator, so okay. it'll, it'll have backup power via the generator. Got it. So when the power kicks off, the generator will make sure that pump's still working. And you've sort of got to walk out, depending on what your grade happens here. Yeah, this will actually be a step down and then up because of the grade change here. So we're going to have uh, a drainage um, out there on that step out. Got it. All right, Wade, you got a bunch of rolls of Brillo pads. <laughs> Hanging out, let's see if we can bring it into the light so everybody can see it. What, what are all these rolls in the corner here? Yeah, so this is our cedar breather. And this goes underneath our roof shingles. And that provides a bit of an air gap for the shingles to, to breathe and not yeah. uh, soak up a lot so of water. When you, so when you're actually putting those shingles in the wall, you're rolling this out first. And it may be hard to tell, but it's gonna hold my, I can't push my hands together no matter how hard I push. And I'm always going to have a little bit of an air gap, maybe a quarter inch or so behind the shingles. Yeah, so, uh, just about a quarter inch yeah. thick material. Who makes this product? Uh, this is Obdike, Benjamin Obdike. Okay, yeah, good Pennsylvania company. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you'll use this on the walls. Will you also use this on the roof? Just roof on this, and then we use a rain slicker on the sidewall. Okay, gotcha. But same basic idea. It's a mesh. Same idea. That's going to hold those shingles off so they can breathe to the the front and the back. Correct. Man, long video, guys. Thanks for sticking with me. I was fascinated to see what Wade does here. Wade, you are a wise, middle-aged, smart builder. <laughs> I think we're about the same age. I really appreciate you opening up your job site for me and for these guys to, uh, to see. If you're not currently on Instagram, you gotta get on Instagram because there's builders like Wade and I that are showing tips and videos from our job sites all day long. There's a great community of builders on Instagram. I'll put a link to Wade's Instagram feed. I actually knew about this house and a few of these awesome details because of Instagram. Uh, so I was super excited to come show you guys and see these in person. Wade, really appreciate it, man. What's your website for anybody who's a uh, area architect or, uh, or homeowner who wants to build with you? Yeah, just wkpconstruction.com and wkp underscore construction on Instagram. Man, I appreciate it, dude. And uh, we'll probably be together back here in Providence, not very far away for JLC Live in the springtime. If you're a builder, that's a great event, especially if you're in the Northeast. Northeast. Come join Wade and I. Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show. That is so dorky, dude. I know. I can't help it. It's my thing now. <laughs>